Put on your hard hat and buckle up that tool belt. It's time for some heavy duty conversation about all things Tampa Bay. Welcome to Tommy's Toolbox, the podcast, season two. I'm Tommy Whitehead, the CEO and founder of Tomco Solutions, where we're not just construction and financial experts, but passionate advocates about our thriving community here in Tampa, Florida. As a construction pro and proud Tampa Bay resident, I'm excited to shine a spotlight on our region. Whether you're a longtime resident or considering a move to Tampa Bay, get ready to uncover some hidden gems and fascinating insights about our beloved hometown. I am especially honored and proud to be sitting here today with Mayor Jane Castor herself. All right. It's it's amazing to have you here. It's such a proud moment. Glad to be here. Uh, thank, yeah, thank you. It's, it's, it's our honor. Join us today as we dive into all things Tampa Bay, from thriving small businesses to major developments shaping our city. We'll also get to know Mayor Castor and her vision for the future of the beautiful region. Welcome, Mayor Castor. Again, extremely excited to have you here. So proud. I, I walk away with so much community pride every time I see you speak in an event. Oh, thank you. And, That's very sweet. And I, I always describe you as not the typical politician. You're actually, let's there get down go. and get business done. Right. Let's get and, things done. And you're so that. comfortable and you're a problem solver mm-hmm. and you're like, you know, and you're a native Floridian. There you go. Yeah, so it's awesome. I wanted to jump in right here because I know okay. your, your schedule stays pretty busy and I only have you for a few minutes. But, but Mayor Castor, can you tell me kind of what drives you? Like, what's your favorite part of the day? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, gosh, I can't really say a, a favorite part of the day because every single day is different. And maybe that's the favorite part. You know, it's a lot like law enforcement, too, is that there's never two issues that are the same. And uh, one of the things I learned of being the police chief was that you really belong to the community. You're the face of the community. So everywhere I go, whether it's a trip to, you know, Walmart, Publix, Home Depot, or ribbon cuttings, all of those, you know, you're always on. And I love that. I think probably the favorite part is that interaction with the community, getting to hear the stories. And it just makes me so proud when I hear about things that our team has done to enhance the lives or the quality of life for Uh, our community. Uh, What literally gets me out of bed in the morning are uh, my little rescue dogs that are like, okay, let's move it. Let's move it. They, uh, they have a built-in alarm clock, but I'm one of those obnoxious Peloton people too. I have to get up and exercise first thing in the morning. So, Uh, so, so you get your body moving, you get your mind moving. Mm -hmm. That that's awesome. We have two little kitty cats and if they don't get their breakfast promptly at six 30 in the morning, they, they they choose to rise and wake us up. So Mayor Castor, Tampa is known for its rapid growth and dynamic changes. What upcoming developments in the region are you most excited about and why? Well, what I'm excited about and really what led me into making the decision to run for mayor is that the city is changing so much. I've been here since I was born 64 years ago. And just to see the change in this city is a reason that that I ran for this office. And it's not just, um, you know, opportunities we've had in the past or you see in other cities where there's a a space comes open and a high rise or a hotel or something goes into that location. We are creating entire neighborhoods. If you start all the way over on the west side, West Shore, and what Andrew Wright is doing in reimagining that whole area and the changes with West Shore Mall uh, going to be developed into a a uh, multi-use a location and just amazing things happening down there out at our airport, best in the world. We're building an international uh, air site out there. Coming to West Tampa, what's happening on the West River. We're on our eighth tower in the West River area, getting ready to start Rome Yard. Um, the West River River Walk, uh, we're going to break ground on that in a couple of weeks the dynamic urban core downtown, Tampa Heights going to phase two for Water Street, uh, Channel Side, all that's happening there. And then what Daryl Shaw's doing with Ebor City. I mean, our city is just on fire. It's incredible. That's economic development. That's mm-hmm. not even talking about the Florida Aquarium and their major expansion, right. uh, the Art Museum mm-hmm. and their major expansion. Or the Performing Arts Center. Or the Performing Arts yeah. Center. It's it's not just focusing on one piece like an office building mm-hmm. or a place to live. You're actually really overseeing a work, live, play concept, mm-hmm. not in just one neighborhood. You're trying to spread that out everywhere. Right, exactly. And even adding into that, the expansion that we just finished up on our convention center And this year is going to be the busiest, most successful convention and conference year that we've had here in the city of Tampa. 
And so that's something that really excites me as well is that our economic portfolio is so diverse. If you look at our port, our airport, you look at tourism, which is a big part, but it's not all that we have. Uh, we're very strong in cybersecurity, health sciences. Um, when you look at manufacturing, I mean, you name it, technology, innovation, we have a very, very strong presence. And that is that not only allows us to grow successfully, but it also allows us to uh, withstand any type of issues that may arise, like the pandemic, economic issues. Uh, we're going to survive. Not only survive, we're going to thrive through whatever comes our way. That's incredible. And does it give you a special thrill when you fly back into town, you get to hear your voice on the tram. <laughs> I listen for you every time I fly in and out. <laughs> yeah, that's funny because I get of all the things that I've done in gosh, 30, what, six years of, of public service. I get that's commented on the most. I have people, they'll text me at like 5 a.m. Oh, just heard your voice on the tram. I'm like, well, thank you very much for waking me up. But uh, yeah, it is nice. It's cute when people do that. We came back. I came back late from, uh, it was after midnight from somewhere. And uh, the, the trams, they were doing work on those. And so they were shut down. So we had to schlep over to the the main air side. And so somebody leans over you know, we're all dragging our suitcase along. He leans over and he goes, uh, hey, Mayor, guess you're going to have to do this live. And I said, <laughs> welcome home. <laughs> now that's awesome. Live yeah. performances she's yeah, doing now. Cute. That's yeah. great. There's so much going on in Tampa, as you've just mentioned, mm -hmm. and we've got so much still to talk about here. And, and I could talk to you for weeks on this topic. <laughs> we'll keep it small and short. What do you think the role in diversity has played? I mean, your administration has been very heavy yes. on trying to make sure small businesses, minority mm -hmm. businesses, LGBT businesses, mm -hmm. women businesses are integral. There, yes. There's a necessary for large businesses and mm -hmm. companies for some of these projects. But you've even had those large contractors, those large projects source direct right. labor, local labor. So how do you feel right. all that's really impacted the growth mm -hmm. here? It really has impacted the growth in that everyone gets to partake and enjoy the success that we're realizing, not just, you know, a few of the larger developers. And diversity and equity inclusion has always been a part of my life. I, I always say that the majority of people, young people, older people, everybody has the intellect, the motivation, the ability. They just need an opportunity. And somebody gave me that opportunity when I was 17 years old. I received a full athletic scholarship to the University of Tampa. And so that really was a key that opened up every door for me in my life. And so I made a promise at that time that I would help other young people just get that door open. That's all that they need. And so that's why we pay so much attention to not only growing our city, bringing businesses into Tampa, but also ensuring that we're growing businesses from the ground up here and that everybody gets the opportunity to participate. So we have so many different programs, our Bridges to Business, uh, where we bring individuals in, get them signed up to do work with the city of Tampa, you know, to get that experience as well. And then also what I call our speed dating, where we bring in the larger developers and then the smaller companies can come in and develop those relationships a great example, and I could talk about this all day, but as our city center on Hannah, uh, you know, we had a goal of about 15, 20% of small local business and minority uh, women business inclusion in that, and it was close to 35%. So, and that's just one example. And those are companies that, you know, I say you can't get experience without a job. You can't get a job without experience. And so if we provide that experience and allow those businesses to successfully grow, uh, that's just going to make our city that much stronger. Absolutely. And the bull in the china shop here is the, the generational wealth. Yes. You're helping these small mm -hmm. individual companies that didn't have much. I grew up pretty poor here. I think you had a similar yes. instances. Um, mm -hmm. And so we didn't have those opportunities. And then we got one and we grabbed onto them right. to do what we're doing today. Um, I do feel like it's my personal obligation to help where I can. And you, yes. you broadcast that on a citywide scale. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I, I want to live up to that. that is, that's incredible. <laughs> but, but creating that generational wealth is so critical. Mm -hmm. 
we can't let the large companies take over everything. We still need them. It's a symbiotic balance. Yes. But but you're putting the the, the money back into the citizenry. Right. And that is amazing. Exactly. And we even had um, individuals, our apprenticeship program is another area that I'm very proud of. And we had individuals that grew up in East Tampa that actually helped build uh, the city center at Hanna. And, you know, how proud is that, that you're going to drive your friends, your family, by that structure and say, I built that. that that's, that's a sense of pride. Yeah, and that's community is. pride, mm-hmm. not just in yourself, but now you're a part of the community forever right. and always. Yeah. That's a, kudos to that. That's absolutely incredible. So we like to call out people or businesses or entities that are doing really great work. And there's a lot of them. Mm-hmm. You've already mentioned quite a few. But could you give me a name or name of persons or businesses that are like really thriving here in the Tampa Bay area right now? Oh, my gosh. I could um, – I, I don't want to pick just a few because okay. then everybody's going to be like, oh, why didn't you say my business's name? But, boy, we could be here for a week talking about the successful businesses that have grown from the ground up. And if you go down to – like the innovation ecosystem to the very ground level. If you look at just two of those uh, groups in Embark and the Wave, I went down, Lakshmi Shinoy invited me down uh, to meet. It was a gathering of, of uh, the small business groups, technology, focus on technology that she had. And it was during the pandemic, and I, I went down there, and I'm like, wow, Lakshmi, I can't believe you've got to have 50 businesses represented here. And she goes, oh, this is just half of them. She goes, we actually have over a hundred. So these are businesses that individuals are coming from around the United States and they're coming here to grow those businesses. Same thing with Linda Olson at The Wave. The things that they're doing are just nothing short of amazing. And then looking at businesses that are moving here or expanding, bringing their headquarters here, you know, we are, we're no secret anymore. People have discovered that we live in paradise and they want to be a part of it. But again, my heart is in those companies that can grow, start here and grow from the ground up. And, uh, you know, you have so many young people here <laughs> that are from University of Tampa. If we just talked about the businesses that were started by University of Tampa students who chose to stay here after they graduated. I mean, that could be an entire show right there as well. That's an incredible thought. Come come and get your education in Tampa. Right. Learn the college here. experience, learn the community, and then stay here and start your business while you've started. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed that here, the University of Tampa, the University of South Florida, they have started to push networking. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know about when you were in school. When I was in school, there there was no networking class. They didn't teach you how to approach people. Do your do your math homework. Do your English mm-hmm. homework. Get out of school. All right. Um, and figure it out. Now they're ingraining that from freshman year. Do you think Tampa is a driving force behind that? That, that they yeah. know that this is an economic powerhouse. So you got to teach networking now, so that yeah. the, the the young people that are running this studio behind the cameras right mm-hmm. now, the twenty somethings, they had to learn that early to be doing what they're doing now. Right. Exactly. And I think it's wonderful to see that confidence in in young people today. And uh, I can tell you for a fact that I probably wouldn't get into University of Tampa today. (laughs) I mean, the way that that place, uh, that university has grown and Ron Vaughn deserves all the credit for that. It's just been a phenomenal um, journey for the university under his leadership. But one of the things, the statistics that I love And look at University of South Florida as well. I mean, that university is is world-renowned in and of itself. But those two, University of South Florida, University of Tampa, and I know we have a number of other uh, academic institutions around, but uh, the statistic that I heard is that about 80% of those students who come from outside of Tampa Bay end up staying here after they graduate. So what kind of a you know, a, a future skilled workforce is that you couldn't ask for anything better. You know what gets them? They hear that welcome message in the airport. That's it. And they think, wow, I want to be, I want to be here. Yes. (laughs) None of the other mayors greet me like Jane Castor greets me. (laughs) Exactly. 
I'm glad we started talking about education. Um, you being Florida educated, I'm Florida educated. Uh, I noticed the USF campus is massive. Mm -hmm. Research projects that go on, their collectives, the Small Business Development Center is now heavily integrated with the, the USF campus. Um, lots of young professionals around. So what kind of tips do you have for young professionals in this region? How do they succeed here? Well, I think the, one of the, the uh, wonderful aspects of our community and the three words that I hear people use most often to describe Tampa are welcoming, friendly, and safe. So that right there just provides that, that open door for young professionals because Tampa is a city that you can come into and immediately feel like you're home or feel like you're a part of the community fabric, and that's important. Because, um, you know, you, you, you're, it's easier to network under those circumstances to talk to people about businesses. And everybody's always willing to help somebody else, to give them a hand up, uh, to, to introduce themselves to or introduce them to other professionals. And so that's, that's why I believe this is a wonderful place for young people to come, young professionals. And one of the pieces of advice that I received from someone who I have such respect for is uh, Governor Martinez. He told me when I first ran for mayor, I called him up and I said, Governor, do you mind if I come and talk to you? You know, I'm not a politician. I would love to hear a little of your experience and your advice and guidance. And he said, sure. He said, I don't know what I could tell you. It's been so long since I've been in politics. I swear we spent like two or three hours. He is absolutely fascinating. One of the things he told me was never go into a room where you know everybody. He goes, you need to walk into a room where you know no one and have a conversation with each of them. And so that takes the confidence, you know, in yourself. And that's what quite often young people, and especially women, you know, lack that confidence. I always use that statistic where if there's five, you know, skills needed for a job, men will have one and say, oh, I'm going to apply and fake it till I make it. And with women, we wait until we have six of the five skills to apply. So that's something that I talk to young women about all the time is having that confidence in their ability. And uh, that's, that's probably the advice I would give to the young professionals. And also understand that... Um, Life's best lessons are learned through failure. So don't look at a failure as the end of the road. That's just a, an experience in your growth. And when I talk to people during the pandemic, I had a daily Facebook uh, live. And so, you know, trying to find people to come on there. And I would get different business uh, leaders, small businesses, minority women owned to talk about their experiences and they would be very enthusiastic. But when I would ask, have you ever had any failures? I mean, they would light up like, boy, have I had failures. Let me tell you about that. But they learn from it. And that I think is where you turn that, that negative in experience into something positive that will help you down the road. And we all suffered during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. My, my companies included, um, I've, had the opportunity to talk to people sitting next to them. These people are 20 years older than me. They've had staffs of thousands of people. They're sitting in $5,000 suits and they lean over and say, yeah, Tommy, we suffer too. We only have a few people working for us now. It's very humbling. I talk about that in my book. I talk about it in, in when I'm speaking, mm -hmm. talk about it in networking is it's not about the failure. It's about, did you get back up? Right. And going back to networking we all start networking, and the first time we do it, it's extremely uncomfortable. Yes, That's a normal feeling. If you walk into a room and you're not uncomfortable in your first networking event, <laughs> you might have had a little too much to drink before you walked in. <laughs> but but even to this day, and I imagine you, you, you're more comfortable with it now. There's probably less that rattles you. But occasionally, you have to walk into a room where it's still like, okay, wait a minute. Let me all take right. a pulse. What's going on? Who's here? Yeah. Um, and your scale is so much larger than many of our scales because, you know, the governor of this, the senator of that, the mm -hmm. president of this might be in that room and you have to know this. Right. Um, but but it's humbling to know that you still go through the same things mm -hmm. that we go through, that that these young professionals, it's, it's okay to be uncomfortable. Oh, without a doubt. And, and for me, I can get up and talk to a thousand people that I'm much more comfortable with than walking in and having to have 
a conversation, carry a conversation with one or two individuals. <laughs> I think I've seen that before with you. You'll you'll look at me and you're like, wait a minute, do I remember? Oh yeah, no, I know him. <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> but that's uh, every day. That's got to be scary because you know so many people or you met so many people, uh-huh. but uh, you do it quite well. You are very uh, charismatic in a room anytime oh. you walk in. Well, thanks. Now I'm, now I've got my confidence. Uh, that's what it now. is. It, it's <laughs> it's uh, Tommy's Toolbox, the podcast, and confidence building session. There you go. We're gonna we're gonna target the words maybe okay. and, and get good. that a little sharper, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad that we helped with your confidence. Right. Mayor Castor, over the past 20 years, Tampa has experienced tremendous growth, much of which has occurred during your time in office. We can easily see the changes above ground with all these beautiful projects happening, but what's happening below ground? Mm-hmm. And specifically, how are we handling infrastructure so that we can support future growth and more beautiful mm-hmm. buildings? Yeah, that's a great question. First of all, thank you for uh, the credit for all the growth, but these projects take so long. I think the first couple years I was cutting ribbons for uh, my predecessor, Bob Buckhorn's mm-hmm. projects. And when I'm out of office in 2027, the next mayor is going to be cutting a number of ribbons as well. But um, when I first came in, we focused on the infrastructure And so we passed the largest infrastructure project uh, in the city's history, and that was the $3 billion pipes uh, plan. And that program replaces our our aged water and wastewater infrastructure. And, uh, you know, a lot of that hasn't been touched in 80 to 100 years. And I always tell the story of uh, Pam Iorio, who appointed me as a police chief, she said, you know why nobody's paid attention to the infrastructure? And I go, no. And she said, because there's never a ribbon cutting for new sewer pipes. And I said, well, there will be now. (laughs) So I've done a number of those, and my staff has now told me that I'm going to be remembered as a wastewater mayor. So (laughs) I'm like, that's okay. That's okay. But, you know, looking at those types of the infrastructure that really isn't sexy, you know, it's not pretty, it's, it's, but it's necessary for the successful growth of your community. So we're focused on those issues, looking at stormwater. You know, as we continue to build and develop, we have less permeable landscape for our rain and for the, for the floodwaters. And so we've done a number of major projects. Now with our water wastewater we can do those the least intrusive manner possible. Like the wastewater pipes, we don't have to dig them up anymore. In many instances, you just line those with a fiberglass lining and then It's a sleeve. Pressurized. That, instead of having yeah. to carve up the concrete, you just right. push it through. I've seen that technique before. Yeah, and it, that's fascinating, too. Yeah. And then put a robot, and it cuts out all the, the access to residents and, and businesses. And then also with the uh, water, instead of digging all of that up, hook all the houses up to a fire extinguisher so they can have the water service. And then it's called pipe bursting. And uh, it looks kind of like a a spearhead and it goes through and breaks up the water pipe and then pulls a new one right behind it. Mm. And you can, I mean, they can replace water pipes several blocks in a day with, with no harm, no foul to any of the uh, residents. So looking at a lot of that are our roadways, you know, making sure that they're safe doing a lot of the complete street uh, programs where we're making the segregated bike lanes, wider sidewalks, uh, making sure that, that we have opportunities for all mob- modalities, uh, individuals that want to walk, bike, or uh, utilize vehicles. So those are the types of things that we're looking at from our infrastructure. We just did $110 million uh, rehab on our waste to energy we burn our trash, and then we turn that that heat into steam, and then the steam into electricity, and we sell the electricity for millions of dollars a year. And so that's something, too, and looking at ways to reduce our carbon footprint at wastewater, just all types of, of the infrastructure focus that's critically important for our successful growth. And, and you're right. It's not sexy. It's got to be so All difficult right. to sell. Yeah. It's it's easy to sell a new aquarium. It's easy to sell a new mm-hmm. museum, a skyscraper. You can see that. But none of those function. I mean, you don't want to be in the middle of the lightning game with all the plumbing shuts down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's yeah. the tens of thousands of people mm-hmm. sitting around without flushing toilets is not a pretty right. su- pretty sight. So, and those are the things people take for granted. You know, mm-hmm. nobody, when you get up in the morning, you turn on the faucet and some of the best water in the country comes out. 
they don't know that there's several hundred people standing behind that. And we take, we have a permit to pull 81 million gallons of water a day out of the Hillsborough River, and we turn that into best drinking water in the nation for the city of Tampa and a third of the county as well. That's amazing. And what made you and your team think, let's do this better. Let's not mm-hmm. just do the traditional bust up the sidewalk, destroy it for two years, re-pipe, mm-hmm. move on to the next block. You, Your team and you thought about, let's use technology. How can we do this to be mm-hmm. Uh, as minimally invasive to our right. citizenry as possible. What made you think, let's do it different? Well, we're always looking for the best practices. Uh, we have a new system. It's called the SIX. It's suspended ionization uh, treatment for water. And it is a patented resin that attracts uh, contaminants, including PFAS, the small uh, plastic particles. And and it can be reused And that's something I sent a group over to Amsterdam, a team. That's the only place they were doing. They brought it back. We ran a pilot. We're actually building the structure in the process to be able to treat our water. We'll uh, reduce our chemical use to the tune of millions of dollars a year and be able to pull those um, minute plastic particles, which nobody's been able to do that uh, so far. So we have people from around the nation that are coming down to to see what we're doing in that area. But we're always looking for those best practices, you know, what we can do that will allow us to to get it done quicker, cheaper, and less invasive. Another thing, too, is when I first came in, uh, one, I told my whole staff, I did this at the police department, too. I should probably shouldn't say this. I'm sure HR sends them <laughs> over the edge. But I would say anybody who utters the phrase, this is the way we've always done it, will be shot at dawn. So, wow. you know, those, that is my, I've said that many times. I can't I stand that phrase. Oh man, I know. <laughs> Why are we doing it? Well, that's the way we've always done it. But um, uh, anyway, one of the things that would drive me crazy is, you know, an intersection would be torn up. They would replace whatever. They would pave it back. A few months later, they come back, they tear it up again. I'm like, once it's up, let's do everything. Mm-hmm. Call the cable people, call Tico, call everybody. This street, we're going to have to repave it. Or we have to tear it up for another reason. What do you need while we're under there? And we'll repave it one time. And those are practices I use in everyday construction. Mm -hmm. If you call me and say, I want new shower tile. Sure, no problem. But while I'm in there, this is 20-year-old shower tile. I go ahead and replace your plumbing behind it. Because I don't want that to leak Mm -hmm. after you have this brand new gorgeous shower surround. It's just common sense. You have access to it. It's marginally um, less expensive to, Mm -hmm. to do it now. Yeah. So in, in speaking of expenses, all this costs money. I mean, it, it, it does. Oh, yes. And um, can you tell me a little bit about the CIT, um, mm-hmm. what that's about? That's coming up in November, I believe, yes. on the ballot. So so we all want nice things, mm-hmm. but you do have to pay for nice things. Yeah. Sometimes it hurts, sometimes it doesn't. But if you want this pretty stuff, we got to yeah. do something about it. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Right. So this is a continuation of our community investment tax. Uh, it's a It's a half penny sales tax. And it was passed 30 years ago. And it's interesting, the first time it went through, the first iteration didn't receive enough votes, and so it failed. And then the next time they put the stadium to be built, the new Raymond James Stadium, on uh, that tax, and it passed. So we're not building any more stadiums, (laughs) although we do have contractual obligations uh, for maintenance on Raymond James, Emily, and um, uh, the Yankee Stadium. And so those exist. Uh, they're not going away. We have to pay them no matter what. And so what we're looking to, this, the community investment tax expires in 2026. So we've put it on the, the ballot this year, and it's for Hillsborough County, Temple Terrace, Plant City, and Tampa. And we each receive a percentage based on our population. And this tax, I cannot stress enough the importance of uh, having this renewed because it buys our police cars, it buys all of our fire rescue vehicles, it provides the maintenance and growth for our parks and recreation, and it provides the funding for the paving of our streets. And we know we lost the all for transportation uh, which I don't think I'll ever get over, but that was $500 million that we don't have to repave, rebuild 
our streets. And so it is imperative that uh, this CIT continues. So I would ask everyone to please vote when you, first of all, please vote. And when you go to vote, make those votes informed. And the community investment tax, a continuation of that half cent sales tax is imperative because if it doesn't pass, that money's coming from somewhere. And it's probably going to have to come from an increase in your property taxes in the millage because we've got to have police cars, we have to have a fire rescue, and then we have contractual obligations as well. So we need that uh, to be voted for. And the sales tax is the best approach because the estimate is a minimum of 20% of this tax will be paid for by people that don't even live in Hillsborough County. They come to That's visit all our money. amazing, amazing That's amenities. Right. And, and so you're not talking about tax increase. You're just talking a continuation. A continuation. The same thing. We've been paying always, it for 30 years. We've already been doing this for 30 years. We're just asking you don't change it so that right. we can continue to provide amazing services mm-hmm. in the city. That's for sure. That That's incredible. And I'm glad that you um, explained that because sometimes it's not as clear as that right. and what it goes to. So thank you for that. Okay, Mayor Castor, you know, you, you mentioned before your terms until 2027. What are some of the key priorities you have for the rest of your term? I'm sure you're thinking yes. about legacy. I'm sure that word comes mm-hmm. up a lot. You know what? I don't really think, I don't ever think about the legacy. I just want to get things done for our community. I had a, a good friend of mine that was a, a deputy chief at the police department. Somebody said, what do you want, when he was retiring, he said, what do you want to be remembered for? And he said, about five minutes after I clear the door. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't need my name on anything. I'm, that's, I'm not that person. But I want to make sure that, that we hand off a city that is much better than the one that we found. And, and I, I think that is, has been uh, the desire of all the previous mayors as well. I always feel that we've had the right mayor at the right time for, city, uh, for the city of Tampa. And so we're looking, our, our housing affordability is critical, and we have a goal of 10,000 units by 2027, We probably won't reach that. We had the pandemic, um, and we had to shift gears to keep people in their houses. But still, um, I read one of the last books I read said, an unattainable goal is the worthiest of kind. So you have to set that bar high. A workforce development, making sure we have the skilled labor force uh, for the jobs that are coming to our community. Uh, Transportation is critical. We have, you know, I always say mass transit in Tampa is more than two people in an SUV. So (laughs) we have to have uh, transportation solutions. And then we can take cars off of someone's budget plate Mm -hmm. and they have more money for housing. And then our sustainability and resiliency. We're making great, great strides in that area. That that's incredible. And I see it. I mean, I've been here since I was a teenager. I am clearly way more gray hair since from away from a teenager mm-hmm. at this point. Uh, but to, it makes you proud. Yeah, it does. You know, I'm it very makes, proud it, it makes me proud to be a, a, a Floridian to mm-hmm. be here in this region. And it's not just the city of Tampa. It's a whole regional effort. It is. Uh, you work well with all the other local mayors without a doubt. And, and it's just, it's not a rivalry. It's just like a, a camaraderie. It's so mm-hmm. incredible to see the region grow. So Mayor Castor, I have, um, one more segment on the show. We call it ratchet it up. It's just a little bit of humor. Okay, um, I, I want you to tell us a little story. And usually we, we ask you to tell a joke, but but I got a particular story in mind for you that I read. Um, and it's about you never taking off of work. And once you're a police officer, you're always a police officer, oh, right? that's for sure. <laughs> so, so there was a story in the news that you and your wife were out fishing in the Keys, right? Uh-huh. And something interesting happened. Could you tell us about that? Well, it was uh, actually my family. We go down oh, for okay. many season uh, every year down to Marathon. And so I was out with my brother, um, my nephew, my son, and his girlfriend, and we went out mahi fishing, dolphin fishing, and tuna, and the Atlantic. And so as we were coming back, uh, my brother said, "Hey, what's that floating over there?" And if if anybody who's a fisherman knows that if there's any debris floating out in the ocean, you go and fish under it because the little fish go there for the shade, and then the bigger fish, triple tail, that type, come there. So we, as we're approaching it. We got a little bit closer. I'm like, mm, I know what that is. <laughs> and it, was a, it was a bale of cocaine, and it was wrapped in plastic to a sheet of white and a sheet of uh, black plastic on it. And it had been in the water so long that the plastic, the sun had separated the plastic, so you could clearly see the tightly wrapped kilos inside of it. 
And so I was like, mm, that'd be cocaine. So <laughs> uh, my nephew and my son uh, used the gaff and pulled it up onto my boat. And it was so funny because then my family was like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? What if the cops <laughs> pull us over? I'm like, you guys just need to relax. All right, I got it. So we get uh, a little bit closer where we're in, you know, have phone reception. So I called uh, the sheriff's office, and they ended up sending out uh, Border Patrol mm-hmm. And uh, so they took it off. It was like 32 kilos of, of cocaine. But what's funny is I never told anybody about it. You know, my family, were all joking. Like uh-huh. my sister-in-law goes, oh, there goes a vacation home. And I said, yeah, we all know how that movie ends <laughs> when you decide to sell it yourself, right? So um, my communications director comes in about two weeks after I get back to work, and he's like, what the hell? And I go, what are you talking about? And he goes, you didn't tell me you found a bunch of cocaine. And I go, nobody cares about that. And it was like... You were corrected, weren't you? It was crazy. (laughs) I mean, it was ridiculous. I have uh, Eric Garcetti, the mayor of former mayor of Los Angeles, is now the ambassador to India. And he and I are are friends through U.S. Conference of Mayors. He sent me an article from a newspaper in India. I'm like, boy, that's a slow news day. Wow. That's crazy. Now, you're sure your family didn't stage this just to give you one more bust, right? right. One more thrill? Yeah. They may have. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? But I can tell you that all the years that I worked narcotics with the Tampa Police Department, that that overshadowed the cumulative seizures that, that I had in narcotics. Wow. That's for sure. 32 and, kilos, is a lot of dope. So you, you put it on your checklist, though. Yeah. Right? Your there resume you went right. on there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mayor Caster, thanks for a job well done. Thank you so much for joining us in Tommy's Toolbox, the podcast. If you have any questions about my company, Tomco Solutions, the construction industry, or real estate investing in Tampa, please be in touch or visit TomcoSolutions.com. My contact information is in the episode description. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, thank you again. I'll look forward to seeing you on the construction site for the next episode of Tommy's Toolbox, the podcast. Have a great day, everybody. Hi, everybody. Tommy Whitehead here. Have you heard about my book, Building Success, A Toolbox to Coming Out on Top? It's already been on the Amazon bestselling list. So scan that QR code on your screen or go to Amazon or any major retailer to get your copy today. I can't wait to hear what you think. So leave a comment below or leave a review with your thoughts.